All right, thank you for staying with Daybreak. The discussion starts right now. We're speaking about the impeachment of Gadi Gashagwa, the deputy president. And we'd like to hear your views at Trevor Mbidi at Citizen TV Kenya. Use the hashtag Daybreak. Coming to that in just a bit. But my guests are with me in studio. Willis Setieno, lawyer and deputy party leader, Safina. Thank you very much for making time. Kathy Rungu is here. She's a political commentator. Sante Sana for making time. And Joe Halende, advocate of the High Court. Thank you very much for making time. We're still waiting for Paul Mugambi, policy and governance analyst. When he comes in, we'll drop him into the discussion. But Willis, let me start with you. Were you surprised by the outcome at the Senate? I was not surprised. I was not surprised that the Senate decided to play its what was expected of them. Because this impeachment was not about the law. Even though the process of impeachment is provided for in the law, what was taking place was politicians reorganizing themselves. And last night, the bell was tolling for Rigati Gashagwa's neck, and the political vultures went for him. Because if it was a question of the law, in terms of the grounds of impeachment, Gashago has not committed uh, higher sins than William Bruto has committed. So if it was about accountability, they would have started with William Bruto himself, and then Gashago. Because when you say Gashago is uh, promoting uh, national disunity by saying what to Amorima, William Bruto, in terms of his senior appointments to CEOs of parastatals, his tribesmen uh, are holding the gold medal. Gashago is just the, a spokesperson. He just speaks it, but William Bruto does it. If it comes to acquisition of wealth, uh, William Ruto's wealth in the last uh, 12 years as deputy president as president is not commensurate with his uh, salary as a deputy president or president, but he's acquired colossal sums of money. So I do not believe that this was about the law. This was about a political process. Yeah. And Gashagwa's position as deputy president was no longer tenable to the political class. And the political class went out to chop his head last night. But on, on, on a fair basis, on a fair scale of things, first of all, it's not the president who was on trial. How then do you expect the senators to decide on someone you who's know, not on trial? You know, that's why I've said if it was about the law, it was about accountability of public officers. The National Assembly should have initiated an impeachment first of William Ruto, brought a motion for William Ruto, and brought a motion for Rigadi Gashagwa. But in this particular instance, it's politicians. But let me also say this. Not that Gashagwa is any angel. Because his conduct in the past, he has a very asabic tongue. And the asabic tongue may have given fodder to the political class to use when it came to impeaching him. But the sad thing about it was that to an extent that even you deny somebody who is admitted to hospital an opportunity to appear. I mean, sickness, can nobody can predict an illness. And nobody should be denied an opportunity to defend themselves. I mean, the only few articles of the Constitution that are absolute the right to be had is an absolute right. It can never be taken away. And even if you are to read <coughs> the Senate so-called imposed timelines of impeachment, those timelines provided in the Constitution cannot be superior to the right to be had in Article 50 and Article 145.6 of the Constitution. Okay. And in my view, the Senate missed on the legal question by a mile to the extent that the Senate decided to omit a very important part of the impeachment. It was about law. Because the Constitution, Article 145.6, yeah. provides that once a committee of the Senate has investigated, the committee has to report within 10 days. Then the Senate sits down to consider the committee's report. So what was taking place last night was proceedings of the committee of the Senate. They ought to have written a report. And if the report indicts Gashagwa, they call him to be heard. Mm. And he makes his representation. Okay. Then they vote whether to remove him or not. That Let's did not happen. Request. It was required that to them that Gashagwa had to leave office by midnight last night. To an extent that they even forgot that the 10 days provided in the Constitution was merely for purpose of investigations, not for purpose of removal. Okay. But their own self-imposed 10 days was that we need to have a deputy president by Mashuja Day. And that is what they're working towards. Okay. Kathy, what are your thoughts on the impeachment of the deputy president? Uh, thank you very much, Trevor. I think for me, it didn't come as a surprise uh, looking at 
uh, the outcome of the public participation. We are told, or the results show, that 75% of the people who participated in the uh, public participation wanted him impeached. When you look at the National Assembly, again, over 80% of the members of parliament uh, were impeaching Gashagwa. So I did not expect anything different from the Senate, and that is exactly what happened. Um, but then, Gashagwa, the former deputy president, had been accused of 11 issues, and we only needed one to actually impeach him. And as you can see from the results uh, of last night, five of those each issues are what has taken Gashagwa home. So you are not surprised at all? Oh, uh, no. but, but the public participation okay. you're talking about was one of the things that people were saying that was not done properly. In fact, I think as someone who participated in the court. public participation, the first day of the public participation was actually marred uh, uh, by chaos and uh, those kind of things. But the, the second one was actually very orderly. But the, the argument was that they did not have his response at the time. So it was just accusations, no response. Yeah, but he had a moment. He, he also responded later after that. You remember okay. he had two hours, I think, on Sunday. Uh, he had another two one hour or two hours on Monday where we all listened to him and he addressed those issues. Okay. Yeah. Joe, are you, are you surprised by the outcome? I was not surprised at all, at all. Uh, from where I come from, uh, as Hayo have a saying, that Korao uh, has chind nichiana, that the cow that get lost, high ski, kama zingide zinapiga kelele, it just disappears. And... Uh, the day that I discussed, this, this issue about the deputy president started some times back. And for those who have been keen following the political uh, events in this country, will realize that his goose was already cooked. And what was happening uh, yesterday, legally, and I want to agree with my learned friend here, legally, impeachment process is procedural. Impeachment process is a legal procedure, but impeachment process is a political process. And when you go in a political process or in a political contest, it is about numbers. When you talk about Murima, when you talk about we, you must be able to say that I have certain numbers in a certain corner. I was also shocked again that Rigandi Gashagwa, the former deputy president, decided to go in a political contest without numbers. What was he going to do there in a political contest? More so when you are alive to the fact that there are new realignment in town. The moment you see a broad-based government, it means there are new realignment in town. You need to retract back. You need to change your strategy. You need to face the new, uh, the new dynamics that are in town. So I was not surprised, but I was surprised with the strategy. Yeah. that the former deputy president decided to go into a political contest with. Okay. So, Willis, is it true what Alende is saying, that the deputy president simply did not read the new realities of where, what he was facing? Or I mean, was this, I this mean, determined from the onset that he was really going to go? To, to an extent, if you look at even the things Rigadi Gashago is accused of doing, he was doing them to please his master then, who was William Ruto. Uh, he ought to have actually understood that uh, William Ruto having been impeached by the people of Kenya on 25th of June 2024, when parliament was burnt down. That parliament that was impeaching Rigadi Gashagwa itself is illegitimate. The Kenyan people have impeached it. He ought to have known that on what energy is William Ruto running today. And that energy, in my view, is Raila Odinga. To the extent that William Ruto, uh, going back on his words, said several times that he will never accommodate Raila Odinga on his government, there will be never any Nusumkate. They are now sharing almost three quarters of a loaf, the two of them. He ought to have known that things have changed, and Raila Odinga right now at the center of William Ruto's politics. Because William Ruto needed somebody who could give him some legitimacy. And the only person he saw in the country that could give him legitimacy was Raila Odinga. But I don't even think he has gotten it. The people of Kenya are done with Kenya Kwanzaa and their failures, led by William Ruto who was superintended over a collapsing economy. So to the, the only basis upon which he's still in office, in my view, was, is that he has Raila Odinga and his ODM uh, troops propping his government. And really, Gagashagwa ought to have seen that and realigned his politics or his public posturing to understand that it seems uh, for us to continue being in office, 
we need uh, a new player, and that new player is in the room. Can I re-engineer re my politics and my public posturing to make sure that I accommodate that particular person? But having failed to do so, yeah. uh, his head politically was put on the chopping board mm. to whom the bell tolls. The bell tolls for Rigadi Gachagua, yeah. and he had to go. But you say that the senators had a predetermined position, but is that a fair position considering that there were 11 counts, they only voted to uphold five? They were pretending the six, to six. They, they, they were pretending to be fair. I'm, I'm, I'm look, look at this, this. If the senators were applying their minds to the issue at hand, and more so, when it comes to a sanction that can be imposed that is of an ultimate nature, removing somebody from office, so that's a high office. Even as lawyers, for the minutest of reasons, somebody just has a cough, a cold, a flu, even accused persons, the court will tell you. I mean, because your liberty at stake, if you are sick. We will give you an opportunity to go and uh, t be attended to by your doctor. Then we'll have another day. What will have stopped the senators if they were being fair? And Kingi had made a proposal that we reconvene on Saturday to give him an opportunity to respond. Give him an opportunity to respond. But to the senators, because when somebody says, I must do it now, it means he has made up his, con he has reached his conclusion. He has not heard Gashagua's side of the story, and he's not interested in hearing it. That is why he's saying we must conclude by today. Even the request by the speaker to push it to Saturday, at that point now seems to be an inconvenience. It was subjected to a vote. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. The voters on that Senate, the senators themselves, were not willing to be fair. Yeah. Because if the presiding officer himself has told you, let us give, adjourn until Saturday. The reasons given, the gentleman is sick. If you are being fair, you'll say, before I render myself on the questions, I will want to hear his response. I want to hear him speak on the issues, the allegations against him. Then you come on that Saturday. And even if it was to be challenged in court, you will say, look at necessity. The right to a fair hearing, I do believe, is far much superior than the procedural timelines that required the Senate's committee. And I'm telling you, that committee, that Senate sitting yesterday, in itself was, they were moved on a wrong premise of the law. They thought they had to conclude within 10 days. They did not have to conclude within 10 days. What ought to have concluded within 10 days was the committee here investigations. They could have come back on Saturday, call Gashagua, allow him to speak, hear his points, and then vote. But in this case, they were not interested in hearing him. Mm -hmm. So when they say today that you've acquitted him on, ten, on six grounds and, and convicted him on five grounds, which evidence were you using? Maybe his most little evidence was on the five grounds <laughs> that you acquitted, you convicted him on. So you should have just given him time to come and speak. Okay. And then you dismiss or you, uh, you acquit, as, as may be. Okay. Yes. Kathy, does that give you some sense of fair counts? Only five were upheld and six were dismissed. <clears throat> yeah, um, yes, that is really fair because that's just about 50% of the counts, that, that the allegations that were there. Uh, and when we say that, uh, the former deputy president was not heard. I, I don't think that is correct because he had all the time, and I remember he spent a lot of time whipping emotions, you know, and making people uh, believe that he's a man under siege or he was under, you know, uh, unfair scrutiny and, and, and stuff like that. Whereas I believe that there were grounds, you know, to really uh, call him to order, especially on the issue of, uh, you know, just ensuring that the country is quite divided. To me, uh, that is something that was really wrong. Uh, and when we talk about the numbers at the, the, the Senate, as they voted uh, yesterday, remember, the, the former deputy president did not have numbers at all because he seemed to have relied on the Mulima votes and he kept talking about Mulima throughout. If you look at the National Assembly, even before we went to the Senate, uh, all the, mem the members of parliament from Mulima who actually voted to impeach the deputy president were about 40, 41 out of 282, which means even if these members of parliament from Mulima did not vote to impeach the deputy president. He was already impeached because 282 minus 40, 41, it's 240 something. And the threshold, we just needed 233 uh, votes to actually uh, get him impeached by the, by, the, by the National Assembly. Then when you look at the way they voted, because uh, we have that now, uh, I think 
they looked from my judgment and from the way I understand the issues was being accused of, there was fairness because they seemed to discuss those issues that were almost irrelevant, to, so to speak. Okay. Joe? <laughs> Yeah, from but did that really matter even at the end? Because they, they knew very well that as long as he was convicted for one, the other ten didn't even matter. Yes. And if you look at the if you look at the issues that uh, that Sedet relied upon on impeaching the deputy president, uh, like the first issue about undermining the national unity, there was another one yeah. about we'll discuss them one by one. His conduct, but, yeah. uh, his conduct uh, being incompatible with the status of the office of the president. You look at this issue wholesomely; it affects the fabric of what holds us together as a country. This issue of politics of balkanization has been part and parcel of the problem that affect this country. In the last election, we managed to have a, a competition or a political contest that was more of issue-based. We avoided the politics of tribal arithmetic and tribal balkanization to some extent. And my, uh, my hope as a, as a Kenyan was that we should try very hard to avoid this subject of tribalism and politics of balkanization. So it is um, impeachment of deputy president. Is not, it, was, it was a matter of when was he going to be impeached. Mm. But he had already set his bed and he was, it was... So, so yeah. as part of the UDA team, do you believe that this then sanitizes all the evils or all the wrongs that people perceive that have been committed by Kenya Kwanzaa? Not, it, it is not that, uh, it's not that the, all the problems that has been that uh, people condemn uh, Kenya Kwanza to be doing are uh, basically about the uh, Gashagwa. No, these are. It is that that as Kenya Kwanza, we have been given another opportunity. That now, the president needs to call his troops to order. He needs to call his uh, everybody on board, and set the right path for his political party and his government. It is actually another opportunity for him to say, now, gentlemen, if this was, the, if this was what was derailing us from delivering for, for Kenyans, now is the right opportunity for us to sit down and realign our plans and realign our agenda within Kenya Kwanzaa so that we can serve the people. Okay. It is just a, an opportunity that the president now has to have a deputy president who will support him and give Kenya Kwanzaa a new face and give Kenya Kwanzaa a new plan or work on the plans that they had promised Kenya. Yeah. Yeah. Willis is offering this new sacrificial lamp and a lease of life, so to speak, or another opportunity like Joe is saying. <laughs> Let me say this. Joe is an optimist and he believes he belongs to Kenya Kwanzaa, so I understand him. But I always say, nothing good will ever come out of Kenya Kwanzaa, come out of Kenya Kwanzaa. In fact, if you expect that tomorrow will be any better, I'm sorry. Today is more painful than yesterday with Kenya Kwanzaa. And you're guaranteed that tomorrow will be more painful than today is. That is William Ruto for you. Take it to the bank. Our problems as a country, our economic problems that we are facing, Gashagwa is nowhere near them. Gashagwa has only seen, if you ask me, is a Sabic tongue. But Shif Shah, the kidney dialysis patients who are not able to get <coughs> uh, dialysis because of a very a failed redundancy period from the transition from NHIF to Shifsha is not Gashagwa, it's William Ruto. When you talk about JSS intern teachers who are not able to be absorbed, who are being under, the ones who've been taken in are being only paid 17,000. Somebody who's been a graduate for 17 years being paid 17,000. It is William Ruto, not Gashagwa. When we talk about the failed economic policies, the crumbling uh, our pub, our st st public debt that is now in uh, shambles. It's not regarding Ashagwa. The person who signs the presidential warrants for expending on the budget, who is taking the illegal debts in the name of the people of Kenya, is not Gashagwa, it's William Ruto. So I do not see any change in our lives that the removal of Gashagwa is going to cause. For as long as William Ruto is there and doing this thing that I'm mentioning to Kenyans, the pain will continue. He may even appoint Angel Gabriel tomorrow to become the deputy president. That Angel Gabriel will not change our condition because the policies that William Ruto is implementing are the pain. I mean, let's even give it to Gashagwa. In his public posturing, Gashagwa was William Ruto's poodle. 
he was doing everything possible to make William Ruto happy. So that if my poodle is singing my praises, the most I should do is to give him a treat, not to hit him on the head. That is how William Ruto has paid his poodle. He's actually hit him on the head and chopped it off. Because at no point did you ever see, for example, the deaths of our young people here. Gashawa never spoke about the killings of Rex, the killings of Denzel, the 60 Kenyans who were killed in the demonstrations, just for advocating for their rights. Gashagwa never spoke about the forced abduction and disappearance of Kenyans. And the person who is responsible, the person who is the ultimate executive in the country today, that is superintending over the deaths of our young people, that is superintending over the abductions, the forced disappearances of our young people, is William Ruto, not Gashagwa. So if that is still going to be the template of William Ruto's governance, removing Gashagwa will not address our governance issues. Okay. And whoever he appoints will still keep clapping to him like Gashagwa did. And let me say this, even when the trigger of the revolution started, the finance bill, Gashagwa was echoing William Ruto's words that Petitia Raka and any MP will not vote for that finance bill. He was doing it to please his master. It just happens that now the master is not a fair master. And me, I always say this. In as much as I don't believe in regarding Gashagwa's politics, I don't even support him. But as an advocate, I believe in fairness. You must give the devil his dues. Even the devil is promised that on the day of judgment in heaven, God will give him a fair hearing before condemning him. So they just denied Gashagwa a fair hearing, not to mean that I support him. Even as you want to remove him, give him a fair hearing. But more importantly, was it in the best interest of Kenyans today that while Adani is stealing our airport, we should be spending all national energy on removing Ashago? That Adani thief who has brought him here, that is the person we should be focusing on. That person who is bringing a neo-colonialist Indian to come into our country and try to take over our ground jewels, that is the person we should focus on and mm. deal with. On what basis are you now accusing someone of being a thief? Uh, I mean, if Do someone... Do you have any evidence? If, if you're a lawyer... No, I'm a lawyer. Let, 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 let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. If someone comes up with a proposal and within one day moves from KA, Treasury, uh, Ministry of Transport, within one day gets all approvals, there's no public participation anywhere, and is taking over an airport for 30 years... Is he the one to blame or the people? I am... The he, there's what you call... The first charge normally, in this case, is called conspiracy. He is part of the conspiracy. Him and the national and the public officials who are facilitating this, they are thieves, all of them. They are all co-conspirators to steal our airport. Okay. That is something I can say today. I can repeat it tomorrow. I can say it in court. And if it be an offense, I will take a plea of guilty. Okay. Let me bring in Cathy on this. Cathy, what kind of political impact will it have, this move that the Senate just did yesterday, last evening? Uh, I, I think... Uh this is going to affect the country from very uh, or from several fronts of course politically things are going to change a lot there's going to be alignment and realignment especially where i come from uh, the mount kenya region i foresee a lot of confusion initially but then you know there's a lot of sympathy <laughs> gashagua has managed to me to, to whip the emotions of the people from that region but i think with time you know uh, people will start understanding issues and we also hope that the replacement for Gashagwa will actually come to Mount Kenya, will, will come from Mount Kenya because that can also uh, cool down the temperatures and the things that are happening on the ground as, Why as, as at now. Why should the replacement come from Mount Kenya? Because the people of Mount Kenya claim that they give uh, His Excellency uh, William Ruto 47% of the votes that he got in 2020. 2022. Doesn't that so justify I think it's then what the deputy president was saying all along, that it is a country of shareholders, which is one of the reasons he's been impeached? No, I, I, I don't think so, because uh, I, I see the president is likely to pick a person of the opposite character of the DP in terms of someone who is actually going to bring the entire country together because a deputy president is actually a symbol of national unity. But for... And, and someone who cuts across, uh, you, you know, who has an appeal across the entire country. So that is what we are actually looking forward to. Okay, Joe, mm -hmm. does this seat need to go to the Mount Kenya region? Is it necessary that that is the next the, This seat is, is supposed to go to a deserving Kenyan. 
someone who is competent, someone who is qualified, somebody who fits the status of the presidency, somebody who, in a, who, somebody who can be the president of the country and be the symbol of national unity. And there are, there are, there are men and women within Kenya Kwanza and in Kenya at large who are competent enough to, to hold that office. And I believe the president will give us the most suitable candidate who will be who will serve as the deputy president but uh, i wanted to to say something from what uh, my brother willis was saying you know as a country we need to we need to understand that we must have the minority who are the opposition to offer checks and balance to government it is within the mandate of uh, Safina party to play politics and offer alternative voice and to offer credible checks and balance. That's how a democracy work. And that's how we can grow our democracy. But we cannot substitute that by engaging in little games or in smear campaign. Safina party is competent. Safina party is a party that needs to popularize itself and offer opposition and offer credible critique to this government. Because the only way, you know, when I say I'm a supporter of Kenya Kwanzaa, it doesn't mean that the fuel pump, uh, when I go to the fuel pump, I buy fuel at a lower price compared to somebody who is not a supporter of Kenya Kwanzaa. It means that when fuel prices go down, all of us as Kenyans, we enjoy those services. And even if it was the pressure from opposition that made government to reduce the prices, they were doing their job. So what, we want, what it's best for us as a country and as Kenya is to have an opposition that play its critical role, which I'm quite uh, happy that uh, he as uh, deputy party leader of Safina party is asking government questions to do with Shif and Shah, is asking government to do with the Adani deal, is asking questions to do with electricity. That, those are the issues that we want. But we cannot sit down and bury our heads when we substitute that with tribal balkanization. We will tell you openly, I was part and parcel of the people who tried to warn the deputy president. Because I went to UDA party and told the deputy president that this friend of yours called Cleophas Malala is misleading you. And he will take you to the, to the political oblivion. And true to my words, he, Cleophas Malala has taken the former deputy president to the political oblivion. Why is this Cleophas <laughs> so, Malala's fault? <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it is important to state that you're the one who declared you know, yourself as second you know, general in during politics, this time. You know, in so politics, why are you dragging me into this? In politics, <laughs> yes. you must be very careful with the people who surround you in politics. You know, if you are very careful, when you were in Jubilee, the people that started hanging around the, the former president, Uhuru Kenyatta, we know the characters. They misled the, deputy, the, the president then. Now, the same way some of those uh, people who misled the, the president then found their way into the office of the, uh, the former uh, deputy president, Rigathi Gashagwa, they again led the deputy president to, 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 to a such a political, to a such a political uh, game that you could not be able to understand where they were heading. Because if for sure they were planning his strategy and they wanted to contest in 2027, you don't go into an impeachment without numbers. You go into an impeachment with numbers. And let nobody lie to Kenyans that William Ruto, when he was the deputy president, that Uhuru did not want to impeach him. Uhuru wanted to impeach him. Uhuru wanted to charge him in the, uh, with some fictitious uh, uh, criminal allegation. But because Uhuru knew William Ruto had numbers in his side, he could not bring an impeachment motion against William Ruto. That's what saved William Ruto. So let nobody try to, to say that. Uh, and on issue of fair hearing, if, there was a, if the procedure the due process was not followed. I believe that the courts will give us a fair hearing. Okay. So Gashago and his team 
know what to do best. Okay. Yes. I have to take a break, but I know you have a right of response, Willie, so I'll give you a right of response when you come back. And also, there's the issue of what next from here for Deputy President Rigadi Gashago, or former Deputy President, because it has already been gazetted that he's been removed from office by way of impeachment. We have not seen anything from the courts just yet, right? Then when we come back, we'll also talk about those grounds under which he was impeached. Five out of 11 of them, there quite a number of them. One of them undermining national unity. The other one is undermining the independence of the judges. The other one is breaching oath of office and allegiance. The other one is inflammatory and insightful public utterances and also conduct incompatible with the status of the office of the deputy president. That coming up in just a bit. Keep your views coming as well at Trevor Bidia at Citizen TV Kenya. Use the hashtag Daybreak. See you in just a bit.